Harvey John Drehos, D-R-A-H-O-S. I was born in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, 19, January 5th, 1923, 101 and a half. I was in high school and I was driving a milk truck and I uh, graduated in the summer of 41. And then the couple of months later, the war broke out and there was uh, the opportunity to work in defense plants because the Congress had set 25 cents an hour, I guess, for wages. Then when the, broke, the war broke out, it was a dollar twenty-five minimum wage. So I had an opportunity to, when I drove the milk truck, I did that for seven days a week when in high school yeah. at ten dollars a week. So a dollar twenty-five an hour is a big raise. So I worked for Cannon Electric Manufacturing Company in Los Angeles, and they manufactured electronic uh, plugs for tanks and aircraft. And uh, so I did that uh, for a year. And uh, then I got a letter from Uncle Sam inviting me to go to Los Angeles uh, to be interviewed for the Army. But I was head of household. I supported my mother and two minor children. And I could have applied for deferment. No, I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. So I went to the federal building and passed all the tests with other soldiers and uh, they, they swore us in and we went to Camp Anza, uh, California in Riverside County. And uh, we were, uh, at, at first when they were interviewing us, uh, you had a choice of which branch you go into. So I started to go up to the Marines and I was 10 feet away and they said, no, 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 go see the Army. <laughs> I looked really young and they didn't want me. Okay. So they probably saved my life. And, and uh, so we went into the Army and I went to Camp Roberts, California. I spent uh, a, a year there, got my infantry training. And uh, then uh, the sergeant wanted to know if we wanted to take a test for mechanics. And my brothers and I used to work on old cars. So I said, yeah, I'll do that. And, but I didn't know that when I passed the test that I would stay there at Camp Roberts for another three months in a mechanic school. And then we were there, I don't know, three, six months. Then a directive came and said, the 90th Regiment, which I belonged to, Half will go to Europe and half will go to the Pacific. Mm. That's how I got to go to the Pacific. And they shipped us by a steam train from Colorado all the way to Fort Ord, which is a port of embarkation. Mm. Well, at that time, we were very young. So we didn't have a lot of uh, political opinion. And we just thought it was a duty of us to go. And so that's, that's how the majority of the young boys went. And the whole nation was very uh, unified and uh, everybody was working. And so it was just a, a, a matter of process that we had to go to war and we didn't have a choice whether we wanted to or not because we felt that we were defending our country mm -hmm. on the island of Leyte, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, it was the uh, tail end or the mop-up operation on Leyte. And that's when General MacArthur then went up to Luzon and, and Mindoro. And that's when we shipped north to the 10th Army and got in, involved with the uh, initial landing on uh, late uh, on Okinawa yeah yeah well it was a lot of small arms fire you know and uh, in our training small arms fire as far as I was concerned I could tolerate that 
what what really bothered me is artillery fire. That it terrified me. And uh, so, as we left Lady and went to Okinawa, we were well prepared to be there, and because the 96 had had a lot of experience on the island of Leyte. And uh, as I said before, when we moved forward the first four days and got in, uh, then that's when we got the photo album, and then that's when the artillery started. And now, when the artillery started, they knocked out three Sherman tanks, and I headed for this one to get underneath, and uh, that's when they hit the tank and he, he came out. We went down uh, this trail, and uh, then in front of me was an uh, ammunition truck loaded with ammunition, and I thought, whoa, if they hit that, it's level. So I got in, tried to put it in reverse, and the Jeep was blowed up in front, so I had to put it in reverse, and here comes a major with two soldiers. He was wounded, and he, he said, soldier, get out of that truck. That's the order. So I got out of the truck, walked, and there were about four guys in front of me going down this trail, and I, and I didn't hear this last shell. Everything turned white. That's the last I remember, I was, and it, it was half hour or more, I was lying unconscious on my back. When I woke up, I was blood down my arm, and uh, my head was, whoa, what had happened? I had a concussion and brain damage, and uh, so then I got under another tank, because there was more artillery coming, and uh, and I felt this is the day I was really going to die. And dying wasn't bothering me as much as I thought about my mother, who would get that telegram. And she would really, she had a bad heart, and I, that would really kill her. So anyway, I survived that, and a jeep came by and said, I'm going back to the ammo dump, you want to ride? Because I didn't, nobody was around. So I felt I had a report to somebody. So we got to the ammo dump and I reported the captain and and the sergeant prince was there and they were in and all I had was on my combat clothes and I was rolling around on the ground and stuff. I was all dirty and I smelled like a goat. <laughs> and so I reported to the and they were in clean uniforms and they were about six foot tall, and I said, holy cow, where'd they get all those clean uniforms, you know? And so I, I reported to them what happened, and then the big siren happened over the island, kamikazes are coming, so they had already knocked out one ammo dump, and I was sitting right in one, so I headed for this cornfield, and I heard this aircraft, and here it comes. I could see him coming down, and he could see me, and there's no sense of me hitting the ground because he, he had me. He didn't fire a shot, drop a bomb or anything. And he come right over me and then down the uh, valley. And it was a Zeke, Z-E-K-E, -E, Japanese aircraft. And I, and I just to this do day don't know why he didn't pull the trigger, but he didn't. I could see his face. He could see me with the goggles. And, yeah, that was a real experience. Then. I get back and then the captain says, report to the ambulance there and they shot me with morphine. And they uh, took me to a triage center, a whole bunch of ambulances, a whole bunch of people. And so I'm lying there on the stretcher and the priest comes in, gives me my last rites, you know. And so I said to myself, okay, Lord, if I survive this, I'll dedicate my life helping people. As I got better, then one of the officers uh, put me, said, you're going to be assigned to a Jeep. Let's see if you can, you're can, able to drive it. So I did, and every time a shell would go off, I'd go like that. But in vain, I, I was able to operate the Jeep. And then in the company, as we, uh, let's see, we were moving forward again. And uh, 
in this one day, we were digging in, there was a big cliff here, so I, and the artillery was coming over this way, and it hit one of our 105 uh, artillery compounds, and, and all the shells were flying in the air like bowling balls. And so I thought, well, I'm going to dig in here. And uh, so I dug in and put my grenade and, and cigarettes and Zippo lighter and, and figured I'd be pretty safe. But then the monsoon started that night and it started to rain. Well, before morning, this, this hill came down and buried me in this <laughs> foxhole. Oh, yeah, what a mess that was. And I was cold. There's no way to clean up and get no clothes. So that I was so tired of not being able to sleep that I said, I don't care if they do kill me. Damn it, I'm going to get me a night's sleep. So I got me a, a piece of uh, cardboard and I laid it up on this hill and I took some canvas and made a little cover and climbed in there, went to sleep. So then the next day or two, the uh, warrant officer said, uh, Drejos, we're going on a patrol. So we went up this trail and around the hill and we got fired on. So I grabbed the Thompson and I jumped out on my stomach and start climbing up the hill. And stupid me, I said, here, take my Thompson submachine gun. So I did that. Now all I got is a combat knife. So we're climbing up and here comes the soldier firing on us and he got him. He, he, he fell down, I disarmed him. And now on this Japanese souvenir flag, which they all have. Mm -hmm. <sighs> so I'm just about at his belt to unbuckle it and a hand comes right under mine and he's still alive and there's a grenade. So I said, grenade, and the guy up there with my Thompson went, you know, and so that ended that. And then we went back. Nobody said anything. We went back to the company, and everybody got out, and I started to get out, and the warrant officer said, I'll be right back, took the jeep, went around the hill, hit a, hit a ship mine, blew him up 300 yards all over the place. And uh, so then... So then I was assigned as a jeep driver for the commanding officer. Now, when we were up front digging in at night, then we'd put a lot of, you know, wiring so anything coming in at night would wiggle the wire. What, what really upset me was the at night the Japanese soldiers would tell the Okinawan civilians to go this way to be safe while they were t sending them into our our line and anything above the ground at night got fired on. And so then, from way up here, the Japanese could see our gun flashes, and then they would open up artillery on us, see? Yeah, it, 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 it's sometimes very difficult to explain how, how, And, you know, I've seen, after battles, hundreds of Japanese and hundreds of Americans all wounded and killed. And, uh, and, and what, I, what really disturbed me is, is the women and children that, that got killed in ok on Okinawa. And that battle only lasted 71 days. And... The poor civilians, we didn't know they were civilians, and that was at night when 
they, we knew where they were coming, so they got fired on, and you could hear them screaming, and oh God, that, no. Women and children should not be involved in war. Damn it, that is crazy. That's insane, you know. But anyway, it happened, and I still don't like that. Anyway, when you're young, you're just following orders. You, you didn't have the choice, you know. And uh, so we got ready to go, and that's what we did. Uh, we didn't uh, object to it because we were just following orders, you know. Okay. And uh, so that's how we got involved to go north to the 10th Army. Mm. Yeah. We're going north on an operation. And so they said, we don't know where we're going. They didn't name it. See, they put us on the ships and as we were approaching Okinawa, we ran into a minefield in the ocean, the big ones with the porcupines. And so we, st they stopped all the ships and the porcupines were, uh, bombs would be floating my impression about the island. Mm -hmm. I thought it, with the mountains and everything, as we moved different areas, it was beautiful, you know. And 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 you feel bad. Why are they, you know, blowing it up? You know, when you're young, you you are following orders. Now, being old, older, and more mature, I hope, then I have a different viewpoint of where we were and politically involved, you know, like young soldiers there and young soldiers here, like you and I discussed, and and they don't even know each other, and then they're set there to follow orders to kill each other, all right? Who put them there? The politician, you know? It was the sound, and, and, the, and the shells were so heavy that the ground actually vibrated, and and you yeah and you see you could smell the gunpowder when gunpowder goes off you, there's an odor that you smell yeah and you could smell the whole whole area was uh, had a, a war smell to it I can't describe that uh, I gun it. Oh, I am so happy to see that Japanese and Americans are, are really close friends and allies. And I really am, after all these years, very thankful. I, I, I like the Japanese people. I like their culture. And if I was younger, I would probably go there. <laughs> and as far as I'm concerned, I've gained a gave a couple of little talks at school, uh, you know, and just an overview. And I always say, as far as I'm concerned, war is insanity. There's no reason, there's got to be a better way of resolving problems. You know, my God, we're all human beings, you know. And, and to just destroy one another is, it's crazy. You know, it's got to be a better way. But uh, some of these politicians are, they don't use any common sense. And if we're human beings, why can't we resolve the problem? You know, there's got to be a way.